All right. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, Manny here. Welcoming right. you Hello, to another live stream. Okay. Good so it looks like I got to mute that. <laughs> One second. Uh, Manny here. All right. Um, so thank you for joining us for another live stream. Today, we are going to be talking about a company called Palantir. Um, Palantir is a somewhat secretive outfit that got started uh, in the intelligence services. Now they're pushing into Industry 4.0, IIoT, um, and that's the space that I cover. And so I thought it would be interesting to take a look at Palantir and what their product looks like, what are they doing, and why we might find it interesting from a um, from an AI IoT uh, industry 4.0 perspective. So I want to keep it interactive. So feel free to drop your comments and your questions in the chat. I'll go back and I'll check them. I'll check them every so often. Um, I have to kind of figure out how I do that while being within my my hosting application, but we'll figure that out. So. Uh, so let's get started here. Let's talk about Palantir. But before we, oh, so yeah, I already mentioned the agenda, what I want to cover today. We're going to talk about the background of Palantir. What is the history of Palantir? Where do they come from? We're going to talk about their key offering, their data platform, or I'll probably call it a data management platform, which I think is more appropriate. And there's some interesting approaches that they're taking here that um, I think we're going to want to pay attention to. Um, then we're going to go into use cases. So um, what are the IoT use cases? What are they using? Um, uh, the, uh, I'm just tuning in here because I want to make sure I catch this. Um, what are the IoT use cases? What are they applying uh, their technology to? And then we're going to jump into some of the AI features, the, the, um, the functionality that they're making available to their customers. And then we're going to close by talking about some of the strengths, weaknesses, and some of the comparables that I see out there to Palantir. So jam-packed agenda. I think we're going to go a little bit longer than usual, but the content is just going to be really, really good. Um, before we jump into Palantir, I also want to make a couple of announcements. We have um, a, another special uh, guest coming on to the show on the Manny Live show, Pavel Beborodin, who is a founder at Blink. And many of you probably won't be familiar with Blink. Uh, at least I wasn't previous to having a conversation with Pavel. But Blink is, uh, is an IoT platform that offers uh, fast building, prototyping, and, and and deployment of IoT applications. So the way that the, the way that it was pitched to me is, hey, if you have a data stream, you have some sort of edge device, some Adreno, whatever, uh, some sensor, you can plug it into Blink, and then you can have a working mobile app within a day or two, which I think is really compelling. So we're going to have Pavel on the show on Thursday to talk about that. I also like his story and the company's story. They're, you know, they're crowdfunding, they are bootstrapping. So they're a scrappy uh, startup, which I, you know, I really like. And the technology seems really interesting. And I'll have an opportunity to dig into the platform and be able to tell you a little bit more about that, more about Blink. So we have Pavel coming on the show on Thursday, which is going to be really, really good. We also have another super special guest, Andreas Welch, who is going, who's going to be coming on uh, the show on Thursday as well, uh, a little bit later in the morning at ten o'clock. Ten o'clock, um, and so he is a VP at SAP. He's had a ton of experience in SAP uh, from working on adding AI layers to their ERP part of the business to solution design, to helping customers stand up AI services and solutions. So he's a really uh, interesting person. Uh, you should follow him on LinkedIn. He's always dropping great insights. And so it's going to be nice to have him on the show on Thursday. And I'm sure we're going to have a, a number of things to talk about in terms of how we how we can help companies get AI and machine learning up and running within their, their companies. So excited to be talking to Andreas later on this week as well. And the invites to both of these 
are going to be in the um I'll, I'll put them on linkedin somewhere so just be looking out for those and sign up for those and and if you have any questions for pavel or for andreas uh please let me know and and send them over my way okay so let's talk about talent here so what i want to do right now is i want to go over to the whiteboard and i want to talk about um the history of a palantir and where you know where they came from and um you know how you know um uh where you know where they started to, to provide some context okay so everybody knows paypal paypal was an online payment processor one of the one of the, the you know the first big one to really crack it um now it's stripe but paypal i think was a pioneer and then you also had companies like braintree so paypal was facilitating transactions between sellers on ebay for example and buyers all over the world and one of the major pain points with that business is fraud so you may not be familiar with this business but um what happens is um if there's fraud on a particular transaction and that goes you know on a visa or on a mastercard PayPal is on the hook for that. So Visa will come back to PayPal and say, hey, this was a fraudulent activity. We had to reimburse the cardholder. Now you have to reimburse us. And so they were making a ton of money uh, from the transactions because it was a booming business, but they were also losing a ton of money because of the fraud that was happening on, 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 on their system. And so they spent a lot of time thinking about how to combat payment fraud. And at first... They took sort of the standard engineering approach, which which was like, hey, let's build rules, let's build machine learning models that are are going to be able to detect the fraud and and let's um, let's deploy those to 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 combat it. But what they found out was that adversaries adjusted and they were able to circumvent some of those rules and some of those models, and so it wasn't all that effective. And so what they started doing is they started combining machine learning with a human. Uh, looking over the machine learning outputs and taking action after a machine learning model had done an initial pass on the most um, uh, troublesome types of transactions. And so that's th this paradigm uh, comes into play, this human plus ML, this idea that um, ML is not necessarily going to replace a human, but is going to um, augment the analytical capabilities of a human, which I think one, it plays really well with when you're when you're going into a company and you're looking to play to 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 sell ML and AI. I think that's a really good good um, a viewpoint to take. Um, um, it's a little bit easier than saying, "Hey, we're going to come in, we're going to automate everything away, or ML is going to take every, er, er, uh, everything over." So I, I, I like that positioning. I think it also it, I think it works. It actually is very close to how I've implemented AI in the field. I, I think you, you come in as an engineer and you think, hey, um, I'm gonna build out build out all these models and um um and 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 do this work that an analyst would do. But then what you find out that is that there are all these edge cases that your machine learning algorithms just never would have picked up on. And you do need a human in the loop. So I I, I like it from that viewpoint that one it 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 sells better and two it it, it actually is generally the better approach when it comes to implementing AI in the work in the, in the workplace as a sort of an, an enabler of analysts and, uh, um, and helping them do their job. So that's that's the where the the idea got its start and then uh, PayPal spun out Palantir into its own company. And here's I think you know another interesting wrinkle in their story. They you know given where they started, you would have thought that, hey, they should go into financial services, right? Because there were a lot of companies that were doing that. Like there were a lot, like banks have these problems of fraud. Um, any online payment processor would have these problems, Braintree, um, Stripe. So why not spin it off and go you know, back to financial services? But what they did is they went into government services. They started working with intelligence agencies in helping their anal analysts make sense of a whole bunch of different types of data sources. And that's where they spent a lot of their upfront work um, in developing services for that for that um, space. And I think that's a really good lesson for AI 
um, providers and AI vendors in terms of going somewhere where there's less competition and somewhere where th that, that if you win, you're going to have a real economic moat. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this, but I think one of the key strengths of Palantir is that they, they have such a strong market position within the government space. I think that's one going to help them validate their technology and two, it's going to provide funding that you're going to need in order to go into the commercial side of things because there is a lot of upfront cost that has to happen when you start deploying new solutions within the commercial side. So I think that's a very that was a very interesting move to go into Govy first. Um, and I think that's going to be a strength and there's going to be some weaknesses there, which we'll talk a little bit. We'll talk about a little bit later. All right. So, um, let's talk about, okay. So then they have, um, their government services and then they, um, standardize what they're providing for, for, uh, a government, um, services, uh, in this product called Gotham that gets released in 2008. And then in, I, I don't have a date here. 2016, they go um, uh, into the commercial world with a product called Foundry. So Foundry is their data platform, and that's where we're, uh, we're going to be spending the bulk of our time is in Foundry because that's the that's the product that my clients would be interested in, and so that's why I'm interested in that as well. So we're going to be really focused on Foundry here. So that's a bit of the background. They have three uh, products, as I mentioned, Gotham, um, Foundry, and then there's also Apollo, which provides the infrastructure for both Foundry and for Gotham. So um, one of the key selling points that I'm seeing for Palantir, at least what they're advertising, is the fact that they can deploy to different uh, platforms that they're forking an instance of, say, um, Foundry to um, your on your on uh, maybe not on prem, but to your cloud instance within your company, and and that's going to be different for each different customer. And so there there is going to be sort of a lot of private cloud type of work that has to happen, and you need to continuously update that infrastructure, and you need to continuously push to that infrastructure. So how do you do that? How do you maintain that? Their solution to that is Apollo. That's kind of how they're maintaining that. So Apollo is going to be servicing both the Gotham side and the Foundry side of things. So those are the three main products um, um, from Palantir. Okay, so let's jump into Foundry. What is Foundry? Foundry, as I mentioned, is their data management platform. They'll call it a data platform. Um, I call it a data management platform because I think that's closer to what they're trying to drive at at Palantir. So let's talk about how you would implement AI and machine learning if you were standing up this function within an organization. Typically, you have some data management layer. So you have raw data that's coming into this layer. Uh, you might have Hadoop here. Uh, you might have Snowflake here. It's you know your, your structured data, your unstructured data, your data catalogs, everything that you need to have a cohesive view of the data that's coming into your world. Then you'll have some layer of analytics. BigQuery, for example, here might be a tool that you'll be using um, to, to look at what's happening with this data here. And then at the very top, you'll have the AI, the applications, the 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 um, the, the the user facing type of um, items that that um, is going to create value and is going to help your users uh, make decisions. So here is a general stack. And um, what Palantir, the Foundry product, is trying to do is deliver this entire stack. So their value proposition is that, hey, why are you going to go out and buy like a single point solution that's very narrow and plug that into your ecosystem? It's one, it's going to take you a long time to implement. Two, you probably don't have the expertise to do it well. Three, you're going to have to maintain that and it's going to have to extend to all the other different nodes within your organization. And that gets very complicated and it's less than ideal and it's going to take you a long time. Palantir is saying, hey, we're going to sell you the full stack of services so you get it all in one bundle and the the word the the term that i've heard that i've heard uh, being tossed around is os like the os for uh, companies looking to do data looking to do ai and machine learning the operating system and i think this is a, a very interesting approach um pros and cons i mean the pro 
is that you're able to control the full experience for a customer. So oftentimes when I, in the times that I've tried to implement a single point solution for a customer, what you find is that there are other pieces that are missing that are keeping you from realizing the full potential of that product, of that service, of and, and, and giving you the full AI. So I oftentimes, I want to do AI. You know, I have a great use case and I we build the model and then prototype looks great. But then we go to implement it and we find that we don't have the data necessary to do it. We can't surface it. We can't monitor it. It's a real pain point. So if you're selling, so if you are after optimizing the overall experience for the analyst, for the decision maker, then it makes sense to sell them to full stack and say, hey, everything you need from monitoring to querying to data catalog to charting everything, it's going to be in this one contained solution. So I think that's very compelling. Um, on the flip side, it's going to be a harder sell because you're 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 asking them you're asking companies to replace a bigger chunk of their overall IT infrastructure, and there's always some costs that have been spent on uh, on that. There's there's hesitation from IT people that that want to be working in Hadoop that want to be working and plugging different things together. So there's going to be some pushback that you're going to get from um, from that angle. So pros and cons there. But I would say that it is a real it's a very real pain point. Like as someone that has been in the AI space for a long time and a good chunk of that within the industrial space, we can do a lot of really interesting things from a prototyping phase. So I can build a model that is going to predict when a component is going to fail. I can do anomaly detection. I can do what if analysis. That's all pretty straightforward to do if you give me a sample of the data. But then having to do that in production in a scalable way, in a repeatable fashion, that's really 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 hard and to the extent that they're able to do that i think that's going to be very very interesting the other wrinkle here that we need to consider when it comes to ai for iot and industry 4.0 is these different data sources this is one of the key problems within our space is that you have companies and maybe move this up a little bit here you have companies and all they have all these different types of data sources that have to go into their system in order for you to get some sort of insight so you have iot edge devices that are spitting out data um uh, microcontrollers um, um those are coming in you have erp data like sap microsoft dynamics they have data they have a particular way of reporting that and maintaining that that has to go in crm ot SCADA systems um, you have external data sources that you might care about, like weather APIs, for example, was very popular for me. We used to pull data um, from um, from weather uh, public sources and bring them in and then do some insights on that. But that all has to come into your data management framework, and you have to glue all of that together and, um, and, and, and make sense of that. So I think that's, um, you know, this is the real hard part when it comes to, to doing AI for industry 4.0 is how do you bring all these different data sources to stitch them all together? Uh, that's the key pain point for the customer. And I think it's also the key pain point for the vendor because you have to do this not only for one customer, but then you have to also do this for another customer. And they may, may have different levels of each of these different data sources. They may be using different providers. So one customer is using Salesforce, another customer is using another CRM, one customer is using SCADA, another customer is using something else. And so how, how can you scale that? How do you scale that? That is super, super hard. And if you can't scale this, then you can't provide this in a meaningful way. And that is the key challenge for AI, IoT vendors. Um, the way that Palantir is is solving this, and, I, and to be perfectly frank, I have not dug in to the technology. It's still pretty tight lip. Boundary is VIP only. So they're right now they're pitching it to, to large enterprises and they do have a program called Foundry for for Foundry for Founders, where they are giving um, access to the technology for certain startups. But that again is by VIP only. There's not a lot of public information out there. But from what I gather is the, um, they have a particular standardized approach that's both sort of processed and also codified. 
in terms of getting these different data sources and mapping them to a shared ontology, a data ontology. And so what that means is like, hey, if you have if you have a particular type of ERP, they're going to be able to automatically tap into that and map it to your instance of Foundry in a way that enables it for you to start driving insights here at this layer and at this layer. And they have ways for doing that for various IoT instances, CRMs, um, uh, OT options, external options as well in a fast way. Um, I, you know, the in listening to some of the pitches, they've mentioned that they've been able to turn this on in as little as a couple of hours to a day. Okay, that seems compelling. And I would like to see more instances of that in terms of how that happens. And I want to understand more about how that might happen. So that is kind of one of the, the key selling points for Palantir and something to look out for is how do they manage to um, take, take all of these different data sources and map it here. Uh, okay, so one other key point that I wanted to mention is around the use of professional services and um, forward deployed engineers. So as I mentioned, there, you're going to have customers that have these different data sources, but you want to sell them on the AI and you have to do this quick. So how do you do that? Um, what generally happens in my experience, having sold some of this type of software, what you would do is you would do a PLC showcasing AI in a, in a pilot type of way, like, hey, give us your data and here's what we're able to do and look at this failure prediction, whatever. And then you will you would sell them um, um, a, a deal where over the course of a year, you would stand up that infrastructure for them and then you would port it over to them. So it's here's a POC, here's the AI, isn't that cool? All right, great, let's sell a seven, a seven figure deal and then we're gonna have this up and running for you in three quarters. Because you had to, you had to invest in a lot of data wrangling, engineering, plugging into their systems in, in order to give them that end result that you wanted. Um, so as a result, we had to implement a number of pre-sales. We call them pre-sales engineers, but um, Palantir calls them forward deployed engineers. But the the result is the same. You need someone to go in and plug everything into the system. So the the that is to me. Um, a key metric that you want to follow in terms of, I mean, how scalable is the software? Is can you like uh, how fast are you able to turn that on? How what's the time to value for a particular customer? Um, I would say that maybe three years ago you could get away with the approach that I just mentioned, where you would show the POC and the value and say, hey, let's pen a big deal and we'll set it up for you in three quarters. Now that's that's not the case anymore. Now you need to show working software that is relevant to a customer in a week, in two weeks. So you have to be able to turn that on very, very fast. And um, I think that's what customers are expecting now. That's what some of the some of the, 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 the key players are doing. That's where the bar is being set. So um, to the extent that they can do that, um, um, that's going to be interesting to see. But again, this is a good thing too, because it also ensures that the installation is proper. So if, you know, for example, if you're selling you know, let's say you know, you're selling like a really good sound system and you send it to someone and they self-install it and they're not able to set it up appropriately and do all the different uh, uh, connections and and um, and and the setup properly, they're going to have a subpar experience and they're going to blame your 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 audio system for it. But, you know, so how might you avoid that? Well, you you send them in with professionals and install it right so that the end outcome is superb and it's great and they're they're really happy. So and I think in a similar way, um, you have to do that with a with with data um, uh, management platforms or else the customer is not going to see the end result that they care about, which is AI and machine learning. OK, so with that, I think let's talk about some of the AI use cases. So let's switch over here and let's talk about where we are um, with um, Palantir's penetration within uh, the industry 4.0 space. So uh, this is a slide from their investor day last year. Um, I should have mentioned that they went public last year. So we're going to be able to take a look at some of their financials if we have time. But as you can see, the blue lines represent their um, their activity 
within the commercial space. And then I've just highlighted some of the more 4.0 types of industries. So here, as you can see, they've had a, a number of a, a big pickup on the commercial side, um, a big pickup on, on the industry 4.0 side uh, with electricities, metals, mining, multi-utilities, industrial conglomerates, airlines, road and rail, shipping, aerospace and defense, and automobiles. So a lot of activity going up uh, on here, and uh, it seems like they're pretty active, which is kind of interesting. And you can you can see here, like early on, all government, and um, starting in 2013, they started really going into the commercial side. So that's very interesting. If you look at their website, what are they offering on the on the industry front? Um, a couple of interesting uh, industries. So manufacturing, oil and gas, automotive, some of them, so, some of the ones that you would expect. And then in terms of use cases, asset simulation, optimization, root cause analysis, preventative maintenance, this is all pretty standard stuff like this, like you'll find this on almost any industry 4.0 IoT platform offering. Um, so um, one I mean, good, seems like good coverage. Again, the, the question is going to be around execution. How well is this implemented? How fast you can stand it up and how, how user friendly it all is, which is it's what it comes down to. Okay. Um, in terms of um, where I see, okay, so this, uh, this is talking a little bit more about the bottlenecks. I don't know if I'll cover this right now but um what else did i want ah so here is a a um a clip that i did want to cover well i don't think i have to go into the youtube clip but essentially it it speaks to the point around data management and um um the problems in going with point solutions and incidentally this point was made by c3 ai which i think does a good job of hammering down this point which is a competitor as well and i'll talk about competitors a little bit later and I would say like, hey, you know, you have all these different point solutions. Here are the ones that I'm, I'm referring to. Cassandra, Cloudera, R, Jupyter, AWS, IoT. And, you know, you want to be able to stitch all these together. But that is actually a lot of work for uh, a uh, company to take on, even if they're a pretty large company. It's just um, very tough. And so what C3 AI, their pitches and what Palantir's pitches is, hey, we're going to replace this entire stack and give you one thing to, to work with. And so, of course, it's going to be about, you know, who does the better execution, but that's just the kind of the, the, the general pitch. All right. So in terms of AI capabilities, data capabilities, a couple to note here, analytics, as I mentioned first, that's key. That's your first layer. That's who you want to see here in analytics. It'll tell you pretty quickly how good your data platform is, because, you know, if you want to roll up, for example, like your inventory levels for all factories within the U.S. for a particular period of time, you're going to see whether or not you have appropriate data sources coming in from your data platform. So analytics is a good first layer. It's a good first test. Um, then you have ML and modeling, which is, of course, important. Um, but you're going to um, uh, that's you know where you start developing models and start getting more insights. That's for data scientists. That's um, going to be important. And then here we have simulation, digital code, low code, and no code. And um, I you know and I think this is kind of interesting, low code, no code. Um, because data science right now is a bottleneck for industry 4.0 AI implementation. There's, you still need data scientists to come in and, and model things out and deploy code. And to the extent that you can lower that barrier and allow, say, an analyst or a citizen data scientist to do more of that, that's going to be good. So low code, no code, I think is a really good trend. Simulation is also a really good capability. This is actually somewhat hard to do. Um, it's sort of an optimization engine of different factors. And so, for example, if you wanted to do a what if analysis on your ability to deliver um, um or your ability to make delivery to customers within the next six months, you might want to simulate different circumstances. So like, what if this supplier doesn't come through or what if the throughput in this factory doesn't um, meet a certain level or what if costs go down for this variable? And then you can kind of come up with some set of, um, um, of outputs that you might expect 
with the simulation using the simulation technology. So in 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 I think simulation is actually a underappreciated functionality. At least that's been my experience. Um, analysts, managers, and decision makers really like the simulation because it also sort of ties back to uh, MBA training. You know, you, you, at, part of it is doing a what if analysis, and they like being able to do that on the fly without having to go into an Excel spreadsheet. So I think that's interesting. Um, I would say digital twins is also very interesting. I think this is also hard to do, but if they can pull it off, that would be a compelling technology to look at. Digital twins, you're essentially creating a digital representation of a physical object, whether that's a factory or a machine. And that is particularly important in industry because data from those physical items is hard to come by. And so if you're doing scenario planning, if you're trying to generate late, uh, failure events, or you're trying to, to tease out what the proper performance for a machine is, it's best to do that in a digital space and then map it to the physical world. And so digital twins becomes pretty important there. So a very interesting stack in terms of, of AI and machine capabilities, machine learning capabilities. So I think that um, is somewhat um, neat to look at. Let me pause there. I've been going for about, um, uh, I've been going for some time now. Uh, Ah, okay. So I do have one uh, comment here. Can you talk more about digital twins in factories? Yeah. So I think that is a little bit late, but um, yeah. So I would say, um, um, uh, as I mentioned with digital twins, you're creating a digital representation of a physical object. Um, I like them within factories as well, in part because in factories, you have you oftentimes a whole you have you oftentimes have um, a chaining of different discrete events and also you might have sort of a continuous process. So let me give you two examples. Discrete events is like you're making widgets, you're making a medical device. So it goes from this piece to to this um, from uh, this station to this station to this station, and oftentimes the the output that you're measuring is at the end of a particular run. And that's when you do your sort of your quality control. And so you want to think back and say, okay, what part, what part did I make the mistake in this chain of events? And so with digital twin, you can, you can, um, you can digitize key parts of those different nodes and you can look at how they're all kind of working together. Um, you can also do that with the actual physical objects themselves by getting sensor data coming off of them. But my experience has been is my experience has been that that is tends to be somewhat incomplete. Um, similarly, for continuous manufacturing events, so if you're generating steel, for example, where it's just one continuous object as you go as it goes from different process to smelting to cooling and things of that nature, um, semiconductor manufacturing probably lies somewhere in between. But there, um, it's even it probably be even more important because you it's harder to check in at different points and do quality control. Usually your entire signal comes at the end of the process, but that's also when it becomes most costliest as well. Like in general, when it comes to quality control, you want to spot the defect as early in the process as possible to, um, to make sure you reduce costs. So if you catch a bad batch at the end of your run, that's very expensive. But if you catch it earlier on before you do any additional work to it, that's less expensive. And that's generally, um, that's generally best. And I would say, if I look back at Palantir, like uh, batch quality analytics and yield improvement, and this is why it's sort of a life sciences kind of space. But I would say you have a similar type of need within semiconductor manufacturing, which I have some experience with. So um, feel free to drop in your questions or comments. I'm looking them over here. And so um, I think that is good. I'll pause that. And this graphic, I think, just kind of uh, gives you a representation of where I see the bottlenecks are and where I think AI companies, AI, IoT companies, platform providers like Palantir, like C3AI, where they can really um, benefit. So one is data engineering. As I mentioned earlier, this is a major pain point. You, you have to solve this. This is so painful for the vendor, for everybody. So to the extent that you can scale this, automate this, it's going to be really, really good. And that's one. And it seems like Palantir is solving this, which is good. 
Um, issue number two is, is around data science, is the fact that you need a, a, a PhD, master's in physics kind of person to come in and model these things out. And then, and then you also need ML DevOps to support that person to push that model into production. And so that provides a big bottleneck for getting uh, insights and, and, and to the decision makers and helping these folks make the decisions. So I think Palantir has a pretty good response for data engineering um, and solving this puzzle. I'm a little bit less clear on the data science front, what, what they're doing here. Um, I, I, do, I have seen um, they have sort of these standard templates called archetypes and, and, and use cases. I think they had a use case catalog. So the idea is that if you're, if you're, if you've done, if, uh, you know, if you're going to do yield management, we're going to provide you with a widget that you can turn on, plug into your uh, instance of foundry, and then you're going to be able to do yield optimization or predictive maintenance or preventative maintenance. It's almost like a module, I guess I would say. And from that perspective, that's interesting. That goes, um, some, some way in minimizing this because then you just have 10 modules from a data science perspective that you want to look at and then that facilitates that um, another uh, way to minimize this is by is is from moving from a code environment to a, a, a no code or low code environment so right now a data scientist they're going to do most of the work in R in Python so I'm going to bring that data I'm going to code something up I'm going to run it and then I'm going to push that R model objects to a production environment, but it still requires me to be in the code doing the work. Another alternative is to just make it have a GUI of sorts to say, hey, plug this data into this data and use this type of algorithm, use this forest um, uh, method, and then push the output from that in this particular format to this area and have that be kind of um, how, you, how you map that out. So um, I think those are going to be two good areas for for uh, Palantir and other companies to be working on in terms of freeing up this pipeline of going from raw data to decisions because right now it's still it's still a trickle. It's way too low. So um, let me know when um, let me know if you have any other questions. Let me check in with LinkedIn really quick because I think I'm not able to. Um, I'm not able to see the comments. Okay. There we need. Okay, so we don't have any questions, any comments on LinkedIn. And we had one from YouTube. Okay. Very neat. Um, so let's go back and let's finish up here with talking about strengths and weaknesses and some of the some, some of the comps that I see for the company and um, some of the things that I would like to see from Palantir moving forward as a practitioner in the space, as someone that is interested in this technology. So let's go back to the whiteboard here. Um, okay, strengths and weaknesses. I, I label them as 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 the same as sort of the same because you know this is more philosophical, but I feel like oftentimes our strengths also are our biggest weaknesses. So for example, I'm a bit of an extrovert extrovert. I like, you know, I don't mind being on camera. Um, but also that can get me into trouble because maybe I say something that I shouldn't say and that gets me into trouble. So strength and a weakness, right? So I think oftentimes for companies, as for people, your strength is oftentimes going to be your weakness as well. So that's why I kind of label them that way. So strength, deployed engineering workforce. I think that's so important in terms of creating value, getting to value very fast for uh, customers. Um, that is a really good strength. Um, I like that. I like that you have professionals on site that are going to install the software properly and get the customer up and running. That's good. It's a weakness as well because it's not very scalable. If you have to deploy a, you know, an army of engineers every time you sell a new deal, that's really, really, really hard to scale. So to the extent that we can see them minimizing that, um, that's going to be really, really good. Okay. Strength number two is this government, the stronghold on the Govy side. It's a strength because I feel that it validates their software. You know, it's not going to be vaporware. You know that it's going to work and they've been vetted through many different types of organizations within the government side from CIA, NSA, army, um, 
you know, the Navy. Uh, so in each of them are doing their due diligence on Palantir and they seem to be passing each one of those levers. That's a good sign. I also think it's a strength from the fact that from the perspective that it's a strong economic moat. So, you know, if you read um, Peter Thiel's, if you read Peter Thiel's zero to one, who is the founder of Palantir. So he's kind of fun. Is the, the, you want to get into a space that you can dominate. You want to own a monopoly in that space and then use that to, to grow, but start small, dominate that space and then grow. I think that is a challenge. That is a problem for many AI IOT startups. They start off and they want to do everything underneath the sun, manufacturing to life sciences, to everything. That's really hard to dominate early on, especially when you have low funds to do that. So I think that's a good lesson in terms of going to a space you can dominate where there's going to be low competition. And if you win, you have a really strong um, um, moat. And also, like, government is like healthcare. There are massive barriers to entry. You can't just – you just can't have a startup and, join, and go into government just like you can't healthcare. Even big guys like IBM going into healthcare is – Really, really hard. Like I covered recently, IBM selling of, of of their flagship AI product, IBM Watson. IBM Watson. They took a bath on that. They probably invested six billion dollars in standing up that software, and they they probably sold it for a billion dollars, if that, if that, to a private consortium of investors. So um, it's super hard to break into these spaces, government and healthcare. And, and that's, you know, bad for if you're a startup, but if you're already in that space, if you're Epic, if you're Epic within ERP, uh, no, sorry, EHR, Electronic Health Records, that is dominating position. Epic is a company based out of Wisconsin and they own 75% of that market. How do they do it? Well, they were first there and they dominated it. And then they're like, they can do whatever they want. It's hard to break into that space without being, you know, pain like very like a lot for it so from that perspective i think it's definitely a positive the fact that they're so heavily entrenched on the government side from a, a negative perspective on on on, the, on that is i would say that um you know it's it's going to limit some of your your market um some of your market as you go into the commercial side so because they're so heavily tied in with u.s and NATO government sources, that means that f countries that are not as friendly to NATO and to the U.S. are going to be much less hesitant to use your software, either for government or for the commercial side. So that means you're not going to be active in China. You're not going to be active in Russia. You're not going to be active in a whole bunch of other countries where there might be opportunity, but they're going to be hesitant to use your software because you're so closely associated with um, the American military apparatus. So from that perspective, I think that is that is a, that is a negative. That's a negative that you have to take into consideration. Um, so um, number three, uh, engineering culture. So if you look at interviews with Carp, who is the CEO of Palantir, you know they pride themselves on being very engineer focus on just delivering the product and just getting that out. And I think that probably works in government and selling to government. I think that makes sense that you're just going to show up. There's going to be kind of a rigorous way to go through the buying process and you show your, your product and it works and then boom, you get sold in enterprise. It's a little bit harder in enterprise. You need a really good enterprise sales workforce. So if you have a great product, but you don't have a really good sales team to sell it, you're not going to win. You're not going to win at least an enterprise. It's not like if it's consumer side, okay, consumer side makes sense. Like you have Facebook, um, Snapchat, the best app is going to win. Uh, TikTok is going to win. But when you're going from B to B, then you really need a good sales force. And a good sales force that can sell B to B is actually hard to come by and it's hard to build. I have experience having, you know, I have had roles as um, as a business development person at a, at a startup, at an AI IoT startup. So I know a little bit about this. So you need a really good team to do that. Um, and the example that I, it always comes to mind is Salesforce for me. Like if you look at Salesforce 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when they were just starting off, like their technology wasn't anything special. You know, it was like a really like specialized data 
uh, uh, database service for sales, specifically designed for sales. But what Salesforce did have, they had an amazing enterprise sales team. So they beat everybody. They beat everybody. So that, I think, is going to be one of the cons for from uh for palantir is that they're so their culture so engineer focused so product focused and um you know how do they maintain that culture that has gotten them a long way and probably has a great product out there for them but how do they maintain that while they start building out their sales force that they're going to need to compete on the next the next um the next stage of their development, which is going to be selling into commercial. So that's going to be interesting to see. So um, those are the things that I'm going to be looking out for in terms of strengths and weaknesses for Palantir. All right. So let's go into competitors. Who do we see as potential competitors for Palantirs? Who should we be considering? At least, again, this is from this is from an IoT um, an IoT industry 4.0 perspective. There are going to be other ones that you might consider, but from my vantage point, these are the folks that you're going to be looking for. And I've got them ranked by the ones that I think are most closely associated with Palantir. Number one is AI. This is C3 AI, formerly known as C3 IoT. They've also been in the game for a while. They started on the commercial front working with utilities. But I feel like AI is a mini Palantir. If you look at AI's pitch, same pitch as as Palantir. Why are you going to put together all these piecemeal solutions? Why don't we just sell you the full stack that's particularly optimized for your um, your your industry? So they have a similar um, 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 approach there. Um, Siegel, 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 I think Tom Siegel. I forget. Um, the founder there also very technical. He has a background in um, from Oracle. He started another company called Siebel Systems, which he sold. He's also a technical person. You can watch videos on him. He's really good as well. So um, I, you know, I think that AI is a very good comparable to Palantir. And who's going to win? It's really just going to come down to execution. I think the 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 one thing that AI has sort of as as a headwind is the fact that Palantir is so much bigger. I think AI right now in terms of market cap, you know, if you look at their size, they're probably one fifth the size of Palantir, and their deals are not. I, I wouldn't say are as sticky. So again, this is why Palantir having that moat in government is so good. Like Palantir's revenue, like fifty percent of it is probably going to be guaranteed over the next five years from these government contracts. They're going to keep rolling over and rolling over. And whereas AI, they're probably going to have more volatility in their revenue um, in, in the revenue side. So, you know, I think I got to bet that Palantir is going to win this one out. The other um, big competitor that I would look at is a company called PTC. They have a product called ThingWorks that is also a really good IoT platform. Um, they've been in the game for a while. They actually started with um, with CAD and design for different components. So you can draw out the different schematics in their software. And then then they leverage that to start um, going to start um, uh, le- uh, doing I- I- IoT and connectivity. And so I, I like PTC. They're a dominant player in the industry space. They're probably the incumbent right now within the space. So I would be thinking about how Palantir stacks up against PTC. And they have really good marketing. They have a really good sales force. And they already have a a good reputation in the marketplace as well. So I got to say, this is probably um, Palantir's toughest competitor right now. Um, Spelunk is another good company. They specialize more in sort of data wrangling and cleaning and analytics. So similar approach here. So I would look at Spelunk. Uh, Proven, they've been around for a while. They got they have a good reputation, so I like them too. And then a distant fourth, I'd say, would be Snow, which is Snowflake, which is sort of a darling of the AI um, and data, big data space right now. But I would look at them for more of a sort of um a evaluation perspective in terms of what type of premium you're going to be paying for Snowflake versus Palantir. Because Snowflake right now is very richly valued. There's a lot of hopes for Snowflake. Um, a lot of big names. I think Warren Buffett's an investor in Snowflake. So, um, and they also, I think one thing that you can learn, what Palantir can learn from Snowflake is they have amazing marketing. The events that they put on are really good. The swag and the, and the gear that they have, um, 
top notch, some of the best marketing that I've seen out there. And I'm not saying that, you know, that's, that's everything, but at least when you're selling an enterprise, a big part of the game is going to be your events, your swag, you know, how you connect with people. That's just selling. That's the game of selling into enterprise, unfortunately. So really um, good lessons you can learn from Snowflake and PTC uh, there in terms of how to do that. Okay, so those are the comparables. Um, check those out. Watch those. Um, let me know what you think about those. And then in terms of wins, what I would like from Palantir moving forward um, as a practitioner, as someone in the industry 4.0 space, number one is more documentation on Foundry. I don't, you know, it would be nice to have something that I can look at, that I can interpret. Like, okay, you're saying that you can map all these data sources into a shared ontology. How do you do that? Um, I would like to see more of that, more more like um, documentation I can look, look at too. Um, we need to work on a developer community right now. Uh, Foundry is still very much siloed into large enterprises and then some, some um, you know, some selected uh, startups that have access to pa a Foundry, um, but we don't have like really like a big developer community that we can look at and say, hey, yeah, these folks are implementing Foundry and um, we, they have uh, code that we can look at. They have write-ups, things like that. So working more on that. And then I would like to see more use cases in terms of how your, how Foundry is solving this particular problem, which I think is the fundamental problem within Industry 4.0 is taking all of these disparate data sources and mapping them to a shared ontology. If we can have like specific examples of how that's done, I think that would go a long way. I think you also want to show, um, if I can go back to this, you also want to show how do you um, streamline this as well? How do you make data science a less of a bottleneck and, 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 and ease this. So um, I would like to see that more from the Palantir team, these two items. So how do we wrangle disparate data sources? How do we streamline data, so data science for the end user here? So um, that is that is kind of, that that is what I would be looking at. All in all, you know, I, I, I like Palantir. I think they have a really strong case to be made with this. Um, I think they have strong positioning from where they started. Um, from what I've gathered, they're a, a good company. I want to see more documentation. And I would love to get my hands on Foundry. If I can kick the tires on Foundry and look at some of the use cases and look at some of the data science functionality, archetypes, things like that, that would be amazing. Um, so if you, if, you know, if we can facilitate that, for, um, I'll be reaching out to folks at Foundry, and, or excuse me, at Palantir and see we can do that. And if I'm able to do that, then I'm happy to come back and do another live stream and tell you more about what I find and, and, and how my opinion has changed after some more research and due diligence. Okay. So, uh, thank you everyone for, for tuning in again. We have our next live stream is going to be on Thursday. And as I mentioned, I have two very special guests coming on the show on Thursday. We have Pavel from Blink, who um, is going to tell us about his IoT platform, which I, and he's got a really interesting story. And then we have Andreas from SAP, who's going to be joining us as well at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, who's going to be telling us about how to implement AI within large companies and industry. And he has a great background, having been you know pretty pretty heavily involved at that for SAP. So um, I am. I hope that you enjoyed the live stream and um, feel free to send me any comments, comment on the video or find me on LinkedIn. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye.